We've been talking about the book of Romans and having a righteous testimony in our community. Our sermons whisper, but our life shouts. And what we say is one thing, but people don't trust you. They won't trust what you tell them. And the book of Romans is given to us in several sections. First of all, talking about sin. Second, about salvation, chapter 4 and 5. Third, someone tell me what that third section is. Sanctification, that's right. And then chapters 9, 11, 12 are the sovereignty of God in relation to salvation and his people, the nation of Israel. And then, of course, chapter 12 through 16, the uh, service, a testimony of service to the Lord Jesus Christ. A wonderful, wonderful book of the Bible. Someone called it the book that changed the world, the book of Romans. We've been speaking about the testimony, begins in chapter 12, with a testimony of appreciation because of the mercies of God, how good God's been to us. A testimony of dedication, presenting our bodies as living sacrifice. A testimony of separation, not being conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. A testimony of humiliation, not to think more highly than we ought to think, but to think soberly and, and uh, to think... Uh, on purpose, what is God's purpose? A testimony of cooperation, working with people, and a testimony of love, and testimony of, of not giving evil for good, but giving good for evil. And then, of course, chapter 13, four concepts in chapter 13. Honor our civic leaders. Humbly love those around us. Oh, no man anything but to love one another. Honest living making sure that we're honest in our, in our financial dealings. This is a testimony. People oftentimes will judge you and me based upon finances. One of the things I, I early on, and we talked about this in our staff meetings, talked about this with those who work in our finance. If we owe a bill, we pay the bill. <laughs> I do not want you to come out there to meet someone and say, well, First Baptist, they don't pay. I want to make sure we do that. If we have to stop getting paychecks to our people before we do that, I want to make sure that we have a good testimony because the world needs to know we're honest in our living. And then we're, we are, we're holy in our living. The Bible says that we not, should not uh, fulfill the lust of the flesh. Then chapter 14, it uh, talks about days and diets, but challenging us on things that are not necessarily black and white in the scriptures but reminds us how to live in that area. Chapter 15, the strong support the weak. Chapter 16, it's unique because the Apostle Paul begins to list a lot of brothers and sisters that helped him in the work of the Lord. And he is in, at this time, he is in Corinth. He is making his way. He has several men with him, and they're gathering in Corinth. He's going to make his way back to Jerusalem to deliver uh, a testimony of the Lord and financial gifts to the poor saint who are Jerusalem. He hurt them so bad in his early ministry. He caused the first widow in Stephen, making sure Stephen got killed, and he, he created orphans and fatherless children out of his children. He arrested many. He made them lose their jobs. He persecuted them. He caused havoc, and it was a burden on the years that he went out. Some people believe he was only in the mission field from the time he left Antioch, only 18 years. And probably four or five of those years, he was in prison in Rome going that direction. So for a short time, man, this guy was passionate about serving Christ. But the whole time he was reaching the Gentile world, he was remembering the poor saints of Jerusalem. And many of them were poor because of him. His persecution, his zeal before he met the Lord Jesus Christ, it was a burden. When he says, I'm the chiefest of sinners, I can't help but thinking he was thinking about those poor folks back there. So he's in, he's in Corinth. And Tertullus, Tertullus is the man who is writing out the book of Romans. Some of the things that Paul writes, he writes with his own hand. The book of Romans, he did not. He dictated that. And the man who wrote it out tells his name in the last, last chapter, Romans 16. So he is in the church at Corinth. He stood there. He stayed there for 16 months, started his first missionary journey. He wrote them, I believe, four different letters. Two of the letters, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, God put in the Bible as he challenged them uh, for sin, that they were, they were not doing things right, and he encouraged them in 2 Corinthians. And he's now back there with them, collecting the missions money that they're going to take back, and those are going to go with him. And he writes to the church at Rome. Now, he had never been to Rome. 
He wanted to go there, but he had been taking the gospel to the regions beyond where no other person had gone. He wasn't one to go and piggyback on somebody else's uh, church split. He took the gospel to places that were virgin territory, and he said, you know, I'm going to these virgin territories, I'm, I'm going to places, to the regions beyond, and not to build upon another man's foundation, but to take the gospel there. And he said, because of that, I haven't gone to you. And he had many Christians that he had met throughout his ministry who found their way back to Rome. Uh, there was some times when, when the Roman emperor made all the Jews leave Rome. And that's when he met Aquila and Priscilla, the two tent makers that were with him, and they spent time together. And Aquila and Priscilla got taught by Paul, and Paul, they taught Apollos, who had a zeal and had the knowing the baptism of John. They gave him help. But now he's writing the letter. He's finishing up, and he just shares some things. He, he gives some people's names. I want to just go through it just for a few moments. I really don't think we'll take any more than a, probably about 15 minutes, but follow along with me. I think you'll learn some things even in this list of names. Look, if you would, please, at verse number one. I commend you, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Chantria, Centria. And then the Bible says that ye receive her in the Lord as become as saints, and that you assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, and she hath been a succor or a helper of many, and of myself also. I want you to notice real quickly, and I want to just say a, just a public thank you for the ladies in the work of the Lord. You girls, we got the Women's Missionary Society meeting coming up next week, 6.30, September the 10th. An important meeting for every lady who possibly can come. Even if you don't have a lot of interest, I hope you'll come. Because I believe that ladies have a special role. And this lady, Phoebe, was someone who especially was moved of the Lord and was used of God. In Paul's life, he said, and that girl helps a lot of people. And I think we could come up to this tonight if I probably said, okay, who are some ladies in our church who help people? You would come up to the same names that I would. <laughs> because when someone helps someone, the Bible tells us in, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, you know the house of Stephanus. Why do you know them? Because they're addicted to serving people. That's how you know them. They're not addicted to cocaine. They're not addicted to Twinkies. They're not addicted to alcohol. They're addicted to helping another person. And usually people in our audience, in our church, if we know our church, we know, oh, that sweet sister, that girl, she just finds her way at the hospital room, at the nursing home. You find them making a meal for this person, helping this person. This is what Phoebe was. And I want to thank God for the ladies in her church. And he says, listen, if you got this girl, number two things, accept her and assist her. <laughs> Receive her. Sometimes precious ladies, and I've seen this happen in, in my few years and 20 years of being a pastor, that sometimes a lady who is a gifted servant of Christ is given a hard time by other people who are armchair quarterbacks, sitting under blessed assurance, watching the world go by and giving criticism towards somebody who's doing something. He said, listen, if you find a girl like Phoebe, first of all, receive her. Number two, help her. Assist her. Because she's not just helping me, she's helping many. It's a beautiful testimony. Look at verse number three, if you would. He greets Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. Here's a, here's a married couple. There's several of those. Look at verse seven. Salute uh, and, Andronicus and Junia, husband and wife, that were his kinsmen. They were, they were related. They came to know Christ before they did. But I love to see the synergy of a man and a wife who love God, love each other, and they help people. Our church is full of them. But if you're like that, keep being that way. If you're too busy fighting one another, then knock it off and try to help somebody. Don't waste time. Aquila and Priscilla, they were tent makers. They had met the Apostle Paul. He, said, he just says, hey, say hello to Phoebe and help Phoebe and receive Phoebe because she helps a lot of people. And Aquila and Priscilla, tell them how low. They have been my helpers in Christ. Look at the next thing the Bible tells us. Who, for my sake, they have uh, laid down their own necks. He said, these people are sacrificial. Unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. He said, they are Jewish people probably who served the Gentile churches. They were not prejudiced. They were not biased. 
They would sacrificially lay down their own necks to help other people. Number five, likewise greet the church that is in their house. They open their own house. They're hospitable people. They had the church there. Salute my well-beloved Eponidas, who is the first fruits of Achaia into Christ. So here's a guy who got saved in, in Corinth, and he finds his play in Rome. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Once again, another precious lady involved in the ministry. Salute Andronicus and Junia. And of course, these are kinsmen, my fellow prisoners. They went to jail with him. These are people that are related to him. They, they spent some time in jail at the same time or at least at the same, same season. And notice, they were people that came to Christ. This is interesting to me. He says they're, they, they're related to him. They served jail time with him. And they were in Christ before him. Now, we don't know Andronicus and Juna very much. We don't know them. We know Apostle Paul. You don't have a book in your Bible named Andrew. You don't have one message in the Bible preached by Andrew. But you know another person that Andrew brought to the Lord. Who was that? Peter. I'm thankful for people who push other people up. I'm thankful for people who come to Christ and they, they work and they serve. You don't know Andronicus. You don't know, I don't know Eden. I, don't, I just found out they're in the Bible. But they were in Christ before Paul and they were his family. By the way, some of you who are waiting for family to get saved, you never know what that ornery cousin could do if he got saved. You never know what that, that foul mouth uncle could do if God got a hold of him. You don't know what God could do with that nephew or that niece that's going wild out there. Seems like it's, they say they're an atheist. They say they don't believe in that. What would what God got a hold of? Them? You're in Christ already. You keep praying. You keep living the Christ life. You keep asking God to give an opportunities. Ask God to put the stop, stop, take them off the rails so they can come to know the Lord. I'm sure Andronicus and Una, they prayed for Paul to get saved. Because they came into Christ before him and they were related to him. Some neat stories here just in these last closing passages of this. Let's look at a couple more things real quickly. He said, verse number eight, he said, Amplius, my beloved in the Lord, Urbane, our helper in Christ. Stachus, my beloved. He said, I want, you, I want you to salute. And he begins to name these dear people and households and places. And I don't want I feel like I'm taking too much time going through these names here. I love what he says in verse number 13, salute Rufus, chosen the Lord and his mother and mine. I don't think it was really his mother. I think it was, I think it was a lady who, to him, he, she was like a mother to him. Somebody who really just loved him like a mom would love him. He said, you, you tell Rufus and tell, tell his mother, who's his mother and mine. That we, we kind of, I feel like he's, that's my adopted mom. I want to give you a couple things real quickly in closing. Number one, people matter. <laughs> people matter. God, when he put the word of God, he put over 3,237 names in the Bible. In the, first, in the first nine, ten chapters of First Chronicles, there's like 900 names. That's why I get bogged down there every time I try to read through it. He said, there's 10 rules, 10 commandments. One of them revolves around the name of God. He exalted his word, that above his name. Names matter, people matter, and we need to realize that. Apostle Paul, before he closed out this story, he didn't have to name all these people. But whenever they got together and they started reading the book, the, Ro the Romans, and all the things he taught them about sin and salvation, sanctification, the sovereignty of God and salvation in respect to the nation of Israel. And he challenged them, I beseech you, brethren, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. By the mercy of God, he challenged them. Each of the things he, he dealt with them about, he said, hey, guys, I'm done. Hey, but please tell these folks hello. Salute them. Help them. Receive them. Encourage them. People matter. Number two, I want to say fellowship matters. It's good to be a part of a team. Someone said teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> if someone's doing something, help them. Receive them. Don't be jealous. Don't be aggravated. Say, you know, what can I do to help them? All of us, some of us, we get more zeal than we got knowledge. That's all right. Fuel the flame. Some folks, they have, the, the one thing that God said about John the Baptist, he was both a burning 
and a shining light, a very rare combination. Someone that had heat, zeal with light, knowledge. Some people have zeal without knowledge, and some people have knowledge without zeal. Some people know more about the Bible, but they won't walk across the street to hand a tract to somebody. They know a lot, but they have no zeal. They wouldn't drive a bus if their life depended upon it. They wouldn't watch the nursery for nothing. They've been there, done that, bought that T-shirt. They're not doing that. They know what to do, but they just don't do it. Other people, they're doing everything, but they don't have quite the knowledge yet. But it's a beautiful combination to have light and fire. It's a beautiful thing he's telling telling them. I would say that that uh, we got to remind ourselves. Number one, people matter. Fellowship matters. Number three, remember that service matters. You'll see the words helper, labor with us, service. There is no well done, thou good and faithful spectator in the Bible, I don't think. It's well done, thou good and faithful servant. Many of us need to take off our bib and put on our apron. All we think about is getting fed. I want to get fed. I want to get fed. We need to start serving. Service matters. And I look at this chapter. I will say also one other thing, uh, two other things. In verse 17, look at this. After he gives all this, this the greeting to individuals, he says, Now, I beseech you, brethren. Why don't you read it with me? Verse 17, are you ready? Now, I beseech you, brethren. Which ye have learned, and. And then verse 18 says, For they are that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies, their own desires. By good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. I want you to notice here, doctrine matters. Being right matters. Not causing conflict and division, that matters. Matter of fact, he says, listen, okay, that, I listed all of my friends there. We're talking about fellowship and service and, and individuals. He said, let me just tell you something else. Identify the clowns out there that stand around holding the carpet down. They have opinions about everything, causing divisions, and off their, off their rocker in the doctrinal areas. Mark them. That means identify them. Say, okay, that's, that's, what, they're, that's what they're about. Always got something stirred up. Always wanting to throw rocks and... Throw ground, losing, you know, throwing mud, losing ground. He said, make, make note of those guys because they're not following the Lord Jesus Christ. They're following their own desires. And I think this is just a reminder that we ought to stay on the high road of holiness. We ought to be doctrinally sound. We ought to be practically, practically uh, efficient. We ought to be very careful. Our disposition is right. We're not, we're not proud and and not arrogant, but are careful and complimentary. Don't complicate, compliment. I'm not saying if there's something wrong, we've got to to call it. The Bible tells us all all through it, we we ought to hold fast to sound doctrine. Be careful, we're not caustic. He says, you got a guy like that? He said, just mark them. They're not following the same Christ we're supposed to be following. They're following their own desires. They've got ulterior motives, and you can make a check on it. Look at the next thing the Bible tells us. Verse number, verse number 19, for your obedience is come abroad to all men. I am glad, therefore, at the coming of your be- on your behalf. Yet I would have you to be wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. There's more things we could say, but let me I just say to you, I think simple holiness matters. He said, look, be really wise to the things that are good and be really ignorant and dumb to the things that are evil. If someone is always coming to you, you're the sounding board for every negative thing, you might want to do a checkup from the neck up for you. Why are they keep? well, you know, people just talk to me. They just tell me a lot of stuff. It's because you're a garbage can. That's right. People come dump their garbage on you because you're willing to take it. I think we ought to learn to be careful about that and just simply be obedient, simple, surrendered servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the things that blessed my heart is the end of the chapter. And, of course, he'll talk about Timothy being with him and Tertius, who is writing it out. He says that in verse number 20. For those of 22, I, Tertius, uh, who wrote this epistle, salute you. And the Lord says, hey, I want to say something, too. And he's writing it, too. But look at verse 25. This is beautiful. A great 
great uh, end to the, bo to the book. Now, to him that is of the power to establish you. Who do you think that might be? The Lord. According to my gospel and to the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation and the mystery which is kept secret when the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures and the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all the nations for the obedience of the faith. Would you read verse 27 with me? To God only wise. Those of you who may be serious servants, why don't you tonight before you go to bed, take a few moments and just contemplate verse 25 to 27. Just think about it. Ask yourself, what is God trying to say here? This is a good passage and a lot of wonderful things there. Let's have a testimony that people matter, service matters, fellowship matters, simplicity, holy simplicity matters, and doctrine matters. And uh, your friends matter. Let's keep those things together.